Good morning and welcome to To The Point. We're very happy to have with us this morning Senator Arlen Meekoff. Not that you have not been here before, but this is the first time that I address you as Senate Majority Leader. Congratulations on your position. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Rick. You know, this is an interesting prospect for us in West Michigan because we're really not strangers to having the Senate Majority Leader from being over on this side of the state. But it it is kind of interesting when you think about it, because I think there are a lot of folks that don't quite understand what that entails. And in your case, you take over a bigger majority that, that we've seen in the Senate since, I think, sometime in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is correct, yes. And so you have 27 Republicans. You are the leader of those Republicans and the de facto leader of the Senate because you set the agenda and, and, and you pretty much are in charge of what can come up and when it can come up. Before we get into the meat of this conversation, tell me what that job really does entail, because it's more than, than just a title. There's a lot that goes with it. Yeah, I, I tell people to contrast it a little bit with the job I had before as a floor leader. The floor leader's uh, job is to make sure the trains run on time, to make sure logistically things happen. Uh, the Senate majority leader is more the executive part of the Senate, and uh, the, the Senate has about 250 employees, and all of those folks are uh, working underneath the Senate majority leader's office, and, uh, and many different aspects in communications and legal and, and uh, um, uh, legislative uh, excuse me division. And it's just it's it's a small corporation in and of itself. And it's part of what it takes uh, for government to work. One of the things I was trying to explain to people during lame duck when we were on the air and we were on the air and we were on the air and it went way into the night but legislation had to be written and people had to understand that the language was right i mean so it's it's not an immediate process and there are a lot of things that take place but it's not just a matter of running that small corporation as you talked about it's also about trying to meet the agenda desires of your 26 colleagues uh, who are Republicans, because while you're the leader, you still have to take into consideration what it is they want. Yeah, they they all represent 250,000 people, and there's needs of, in every type of community, and you have to balance that with where we're going as a state, and uh, matching that up with the the House's agenda, and all with the governor and all of us have this similar goal to make a better Michigan but we don't always agree on the details but that's not not dissimilar from any family uh, uh, of, uh, of, of West Michigan or any part of Michigan you can sit around the dinner table and most everybody doesn't agree totally agree on all the issues and, and that's where we are as a family as well well we're going to talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the show and talk a little bit about the agenda that you may want to set but let's start with another agenda that was set earlier this week the governor every year delivers a state of the state address and that pretty well lays out what the executive branch would like to do over the next uh, year at least and in this case the governor talked about a number of different things i know we're going to talk about uh, energy in a little bit we're going to talk about some other things that, that we that uh, i know that will be of interest but i want to talk about something that seems like a really big deal to me if i'm not mistaken if you combine the department of community health and human services that becomes a massive yes. group is it how many people? 14,000 14, people. people. Employees, yes. Yeah, so I mean, that becomes one really major part of government. Uh, what is your take on that and, and, and your understanding of what the governor yeah. wants to and, do? The governor laid out a very challenging, but um, you know, thoughtful, I think, very thoughtful and reasoned approach to where we're going to go and a vision of where we're going to go. And he, he mentioned that he wants to combine that. At one time they were combined when they were, uh, it was a different thing. But I think the part that I took away from it most is he really wants to reduce the eligibility hoops that people have to jump through, take away all that uh, nonsense that goes in there. But he's never shied away from a very large challenge. And, uh, and putting together a department, two departments that are 14,000 people is difficult. And, and I, I, I know he doesn't underestimate it. Uh, what we're looking for in the end is cost savings in the bureaucracy and the ability for people to get services in a timely fashion uh, without all these hoops that they have to jump through and, and better for the state of Michigan. And the, and the end goal, as the governor said, is to make sure that when they're served and how they get services that at some point they're a functional person uh, that wants to get back in society and contribute, and that's the goal, is to get them back into society at a functional role. One of the things the governor had talked about prior to making this announcement, and he had certainly telegraphed this was something he wanted to do in terms of state of the state, but he had talked about the way services are delivered in the state in little slivers, that this group handles this part of your life, or this group handles this part of your life. Part of this is an attempt, uh, at least from his perspective, in getting all of the services in one place, so if you need these services, 
you don't have to go to four or five different offices. You can go into one place and get what services that the state has available and at the same time, as you point out, get past those services yeah. if possible. Right. And I think the governor laid it out pretty well when he talked about the way that uh, some of these folks have been put in local schools. And I think I forgot how many you said that there were, but they have been very, very successful in, in uh, combining all of those things under a, a service provider there at, at the school. And that's worked very, very well. So that's how, how he's kind of arrived at it. If it, they can do it in a larger scale, uh, not just at the school, but or maybe more schools, and maybe that's how it works. And again, uh, getting them off those services is the goal. There are a number of issues that we won't get to in the state of the state, so I jump around a little bit, not to be confusing, but to try to hit the high points. One of the things that I heard some feedback on, I was in Washington, but I heard some immediate feedback on a subject that has been discussed before, and that is the third grade reading requirement. The governor mentioned that. It is something that as an abstract, most people would say, well, of course, third graders need to have a higher requirement, and you want every third grader to be able to read at level. However, there are concerns about what happens if they don't, for example, holding students back. I know sure. the governor mentioned that. Where are we, do you think, as a legislative body, where are you in the Senate and over in the House, uh, in terms of adopting something that would say that at third grade you have to meet this requirement? It is one of our priorities. I haven't seen the House priorities yet, but it's in the first 90, 120 days, it's one of the things we want to make sure that we tackle and finish. It was near completion at the end of last session, didn't quite get there, along with teacher effectiveness and a number of other things that hopefully the, the, the young children from P, well, as we call it P3, mm -hmm. to try to be uh, that sort of ready at third grade so that the next level of learning continues to go at a, at a much accelerated rate. Uh, what we're trying to get is so that our students, after they graduate high school or a two-year certificate of completion or college, are the best students around so that they ha they can compete in a global economy because our jobs are now global. They're not necessarily a, just West Michigan or just the Midwest anymore. They're all about jobs around the world. And they to be competitive, to be uh, considered for those jobs, they have to be well-trained. Is there a hurdle when it comes to setting a standard at the third grade that some fear could require students to retake the third grade? Uh, possible, but there's also support groups outside of what we do in public schools and Christian schools. Uh, Kids Hope, for example, folks like that that are volunteers. They adopt a school. Maybe a church group adopts a school, and they help uh, additional uh, kids with extra challenges to help them get by that those hurdles. So it isn't always just about what the government does. That's important. But other communities, if they adopt a school and help them along, and uh, many of them are in Zealand in my district that, that this has been started, has been very, very successful. And it, 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 it takes a village. I'm not going to say it in the terms that uh, Hillary has said, but it takes more more people to make sure that that happens. When you look at education, you and I have talked about this before, uh, I mean it obviously is one of the primary functions of what government does uh, in, in as a society. We try to provide uh, that core education. Are we making the right steps? Are we moving in the right direction? Because I know that the governor has asked for and in the legislature have given him more uh, money for preschool, preschool and, er yes. and early childhood education, which most educators tell me is some of the most important place to, to spend money. They, of course, would like to have more money uh, in that. When you talk about third grade reading levels, again, attacking the issue at the youngest levels where students have a better ability uh, to learn, are, are we now starting to head in the right direction with these things? I think so, and under the education chairman that we've had, uh, the most recent and the ones we will have going forward, I think you're going to see some very thoughtful, uh, engaging things that, that put our children on that right path. And we'll have to measure to make sure that we are doing that, but I think we are on the right path. The governor also asked the legislature to consider and continue to discuss the expansion of Elliot Larson. It is something that I probably had more conversation with members about, both in the House, not as much in the Senate, but certainly in the House uh, in this last cycle, because there are a wide range of views about what should happen. And the conversation the governor is ha having about extending the civil rights ordinance within this state that would include uh, uh, gay, uh, bisexual, other uh, folks within this, this compact. Where is that? Uh, well, first let me just say, nobody should be discriminated against. I mean, that goes with, almost without saying. Uh, the number of things that are in front of us, the governor mentioned the bu budget challenges with the tax credits that are there, a uh, number of other things that we have in front of us, uh, it, it elicits a lot of emotion. 
uh, a lot of attention from the media, but it isn't one of the top things that we're going to deal with. There is, there again, just let me say, there's, there's no one that should be discriminated against. When you talk, when we come back, we're going to take a break in a couple of minutes. And when we come back, I want to talk about the the budget and and, and the credits, uh, the tax credits that uh, almost. It is almost an inverse thought that because the economy is getting better, there are more tax credits out there. We're going to talk there about that. More value. Yeah, yes, that's yes. right. We're going to talk about that coming up in our in our second half. But let's talk about uh, one other thing before we we get into this break, and that is health care. And you and I, as you sat down, you said you said about yourself, you know, people my age, well, people our age, and mm -hmm. a lot of people out there who are going to be moving through this health care system uh, in the very near future. Uh, where is the state in terms of the health care that the state will have to provide, uh, both uh, from a health standpoint and a financial standpoint? Yeah, that, this is a, uh, a looming thing that I think not everybody's aware of. Folks of our age are the largest group of people that will consume health care services ever in the history of the world. I'm, I'm not exaggerating that. And our generation, I mean, there's our generation the expects something a little bit different from their health care than the generation just prior to us. And we are going to have some very serious discussions about cost, quality, and access. Because you're talking about a huge volume of people that are going to be accessing that, and we're living longer. So a number of us, may, hopefully ourselves, you and I, will be retired longer than we've ever worked. And what that health care is going to be consisting of, again, how do we afford it? How do we make sure people can access it? And is it quality uh, health care? That's a huge looming problem and a huge looming cost for the state as well. So as we move through that, uh, we may not be able to solve all those problems in this four years that we're looking at, but we really seriously have to understand the looming presence of that group of people and the, and the consumption of the health care services. And what you've said without uh, being specific about it, while there are going to be more of us consuming that health care, there are going to be fewer people in the workforce, presumably, that will be asked to contribute in some way to, to pay for that. Well, I would say it in the other way. If we've done our work with the tax code and a number of things to improve Michigan, hopefully Michigan's the place to be, I believe it is, and there'll be more people working here so that we can support that. And, and I don't mean it to be as public health or anything like that, but I, I believe Michigan Michigan's on the right track for the recovery. Our revenues are up as much as we would like, but I believe the Michigan, the Michigan we're crafting and putting out uh, for others is the Michigan that our friends, our neighbors, maybe even our children have left Michigan for other opportunities. They're going to want to come back to here in Michigan because it's the place to be. Senator, let's talk a little bit about the Revenue Estimating Conference. Uh, it, it is a process that, as I used to say, I was blissfully ignorant of until there came a time in the state where we were all focused on dollars and cents. And uh, every few months, uh, the groups get together with some experts and take a look at what they believe will be coming in and what is going out of the state coffers. This last Revenue Estimating Conference as was telegraphed by the governor, uh, showed that there is uh, pretty good revenue coming in, but there are some new revenue drains uh, in the form of uh, refundable tax credits. So let's talk, uh, first of all, about the dollars and cents. Where are we statewide when it comes to the Treasury and the intake? Sure. I think you, you've made a good point there. Our challenges in this budget are, n are not tied to any structural problems or, or a decrease in revenue. They are about some tax credits that were thought to be good policy in 2009, in particular two companies with the very large tax credits. And ironically, as they didn't exercise them over some period of time, they actually became more valuable and they chose to exercise them in this coming budget year, which uh, made a very large uh, revenue going out. Uh, I believe, if I've read my email correctly, we're going to have a uh, House and Senate Joint Committee looking at why this is. Can we predict this a little bit better? Because these are contracts that have been signed and back to 2009. So you can't really break contracts, but maybe you can modify them with the, person, the folks that are going to be receiving them, maybe smooth them out. Uh, also, for our, your viewers, when Governor uh, Snyder came in, he discontinued this mega credit process. So we don't have these, but we have these obligations. So that's basically our budget challenge this year. Uh, Chairman Hildebrand and others have told me they're working very diligently. And they believe they'll have a, a pretty good solution for us coming forward, but they won't report that uh, right away. We have another estimated conference in May, and then we will have known how much of the income tax money is paid from April to May, and we'll have a better view. So maybe it will be better than what we know right now, or maybe it will be worse as well. Uh, let's talk about what this really means. We're looking at about $400 million? Well, it's about 
just sh over 300 million for this budget year that we're in and 500 million in the next budget year. Okay, so if you had 300 million dollars and most or all of that money would be general fund money. Yes, correct. So uh, if you look at a general fund of somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 billion dollars round numbers. Mm -hmm. So the the deficit we're looking at is certainly significant. If it was coming out of your pocket or mine, we'd think it was a heck of a lot of money. Yes. But the the fact of the matter is, this isn't the kind of deficit, and as you point out, it's not a structural deficit, but it's not the kind of deficit that we were seeing 10 years ago. Correct. Uh, but still, it's something that, uh, you said Senator Hildenbrand, who, by the way, is the appropriation chairman over the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, is going to have to deal with, along with his counterparts over in the House and a number of other members, something we want to continue to follow up on. Do you think, going forward, that this problem has been stemmed. That is, that the governor said when he came in, as you pointed out, that he wanted these tax credits to go away because he saw them as just another backdoor appropriation. Yeah. So, do do we have that un under yeah, control? There are no, there the program of mega credits no longer exists. So, th this is happening now. It's not going to be happening five years from today. Well, our challenge will be to make sure it doesn't happen so that people aren't surprised who are serving in the legislature five or ten years from now. All right, let's talk about another money issue. It was in the uh, state of the state. It's been in the state of the state for about four years, and that's roads. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, lame duck session came around. Uh, as an observer, I was surprised with what the outcome was. You, you as a senator, may not have been, but uh, most of us had been focused on the idea of some type of increase in gas tax to pay for roads. Governor said he needed $1.2 billion a year over the next 10 years. Others believe that figure could be higher than that, but without arguing numbers. That's not exactly what happened because, uh, my word's not yours, the votes weren't there to do it. Um, and so they, you and, and others uh, in the Senate and the House came up with a plan that is a little confusing and convoluted uh, unless you were there as it all was put together. Tell me a little bit about the roads funding and, and where we are, what needs to happen. Yeah. It, it is confusing. I think you used the right word because the way we were funding roads prior to this proposal that's going to be on the ballot in May, uh, not all of the road money was spent on roads. Not all of the taxes gathered on fuel were spent on roads. So we're trying to untangle it to make sure when, when the citizens pay some sort of tax on fuel that that money goes to roads. Now that left, because of Proposal A, that left a big hole in other parts of the budget, general, uh, excuse me, local governments and schools. So we're trying to make sure we the the taxes paid on fuel go to roads, and our schools are held in the in, a, in the highest regard as well, so we can do that. So, the, hence the proposal. Now, as, as many folks say in Lansing, there's enough in there that everybody hates something. Right. And that's probably true of this proposal. I uh, will be on the ballot. I will. I will be a very vocal supporter of this. Uh, again, there's parts of it I don't like. There was parts of the Senate plan that we had sent to the House that I like better. There's part of the House plan that but this is what you could get for the famous zip code, right? 56, 20, and one. 56 House members, 20 senators, one governor, and this is where we are. So I'm going to be a very vocal supporter. Uh, again, solving the problem and moving the tax to the wholesale of the price of gas is also much better than putting it on the other side. And this will help fund our roads, I believe, going long into the future. Uh, but I do think we need to consider not taxing fuel at some point in the future. I don't know how far ahead. If we have continue to have more fuel-efficient cars and battery-operated cars, taxing fuel may not be the way to go, but it is right now. And just so people are clear, this was a decision on the part of the legislature. They did pass a number uh, of different provisions that will become law if the public vote part, which is the sales tax increase, and constitutionally that has to be voted on by the people of the state of Michigan. So it right. isn't that, that the, the legislature said, we're not going to decide, you decide. The legislature said, this is what we've decided, but in order for it to be implemented, the people also have to agree, right? right. Again, all the way back to Proposal A, we've now said that if there's going to be a sales tax increase, uh, it needs to be go, go to the vote of the people, and that's the portion that we've done. I also point out to your viewers that when it's passed, I, and I believe it will be, and it'll be uh, not easy, but I believe it will be, it doesn't take effect till October. So, so this would be for the next fiscal year? Correct. Okay, so, and it would be October 1? Uh, uh, correct, and as it begins to go in place, uh, a couple of things that I think are very important. We're still paying interest and expense on roads we've built under Angular administration. 
build Michigan one, two, and three. Right. There are bonds out there that we're going to pay off at the very beginning of this. The first year, four hundred million dollars is going to go right to pay off debt. The next year, eight hundred million to pay off debt, and then roads are going to be constructed also with that new money. So we're paying off our debt as well. Let's talk for a moment. You brought this up, uh, and this is a little different, but it kind of plays into this. You said that taxing fuel may not be the long-term answer, and we all know that, for example, the vehicle I drive, if I was driving the same vehicle 10 years older, mm -hmm. I'd get probably half the gas Correct. mileage that I get now. So gas mileage is getting better. That's a good thing. There are going to be alternative forms, whether it's battery, which now seems to be the preferred way, but there are other plans that, that, that could be implemented for vehicles, uh, propulsion that could change. So the energy delivery system is changing, and that may change the taxes, but it's not just for cars. Energy in general is changing, and that's something else that I think the governor talked about a little bit in the state of the state, but something I know you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, the governor mentioned he's going to have a, a special message in March about energy, and Chairman Knopf, chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, is probably one of the, our gifted very gifted uh, senators on this issue. He's, he's probably worked on one this for of, a lot of years. He's worked on this for a lot of years as one of the experts legislatively. And we have some serious challenges from the federal government given the, the rules that the EPA is about to implement. And it will make it very difficult for us to maintain our coal powered power plants here. So we are um, looking at a deficit maybe in our energy um, ability to produce energy in the state in a couple of years. Uh, so we need to look at all the alternatives. And, and me personally, my energy policy has been all the above, but they have to be affordable, they have to be reliable and, and not subsidized. Because uh, we could have a huge impact on the cost of energy to our citizens. And it's critical also for our economy to continue to have that base load energy, the ability to grow and expand. And I think the governor mentioned one thing that we, we, we probably don't pay enough attention to. It's uh, the avoidance of using energy. The cheapest kilowatt hour you have is the one that you don't buy. So if we are able to be efficient with our energy as, as well, we need to consider those things. And this, uh, we, we already have a renewable energy uh, standard that was in place. Senator Knopf's worked on that yes. with Governor Granholm, tried to come to a compromise. Uh, and, and so all of this plays into that process. But you talk about a couple of years. This is a big ship to turn around. Uh, it's going to take a long time to change the way yeah. that we deliver. Yeah. Even if you said to, right today you want to build a new power plant of some sort, you're talking about six to ten years by the time you get all the permitting, the siting, and everything done because there's not just state regulations, which sometimes strangle and, and hold up a project, but federal ones as well. So we, uh, we have an interim piece here that we're going to have to figure out how to do that. Uh, Senator, I, on one hand, I'm disappointed because we're almost out of time. On the other hand, I'm not too worried because I know you'll come back and join us again. But uh, in, in the 30 seconds or so we have left, it's not fair to ask you to, to, to lay it out. But just briefly, as the Senate Majority Leader and going into this session, uh, what is the number one priority for you? The number one priority, and I mentioned it briefly before, uh, we lost a million people over the last decade. Our state is less because they've left. But they had opportunities other places, and they needed to provide for their families. Our goal is to make sure people don't think about Lansing, that they think about Michigan as the greatest place to have the opportunity to raise their family, uh, have their kids and their grandkids enjoy their business and, and the Four Seasons. And I believe we're going to be that place to be. And uh, I'm not looking at which camera it is, but I would look at you and just say to those folks that have left and you're seeing this program, please come back. We want you to come back. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. We'll have you on again very soon. Senator Arlen Meekoff, Senate Majority Leader. We're back with more To the Point in just a moment.